So, good afternoon. Today we're going to look at verse 3 of the 37 practices of bodhisattvas. So it reads, By avoiding bad objects, disturbing emotions gradually decrease. Without distraction, virtuous activities naturally increase. With clarity of mind, conviction in the teaching arises. Cultivate seclusion. This is the practice of bodhisattvas. So this verse follows on from the previous one. The previous one spoke about uh, leaving one's homeland, and this is about going into seclusion, or we could say retreat, living in solitude. So just leaving a, one's homeland and just going into seclusion are not necessarily going to be beneficial. It really depends on why we do these things and what we're doing when we're in these situations. For example, you know, a lot of people leave their homeland, but not necessarily because they want to decrease their disturbing emotions. Sometimes it's actually um, perpetuating, increasing. For example, uh, a lot of people go traveling. Tourism has become a huge business these days. <laughs> and, you know, people travel to other countries to see new sites and taste new foods and buy new things. And so their attachments are increasing rather than decreasing. And it's also the same with going into solitude or seclusion. I was thinking about this guy called the, the Unabomber. Remember the Unabomber? I guess he's in prison now, but I heard that, yeah, he was living in seclusion. He was living in a little cabin in the woods in Montana, wasn't it? But what he was doing was certainly not virtuous. He was making bombs and mailing them to people, and people died, right? People were killed and injured by his bombs. And then, um, as Venerable Chunyi mentioned the other day, uh, the story of this guy who was in three-year retreat, and when he came out and met his lama, you know, and talked, the lama said, well, his, you know, his mind hasn't changed, right? So even being in a three-year retreat doesn't necessarily improve your mind. And I've heard the Dalai Lama talk about that, too. He said that he sometimes meet people, he meets people who've done a three-year retreat, but they don't seem to have improved their mind very much. Sometimes they have more pride, more arrogance. You know, I did a three-year retreat. So he says, sometimes maybe it's better to stay in the world, stay in society and help people, help the world, rather than do that. I don't think he means we shouldn't do retreat. <laughs> the point is, what do we do and how do we do it? That's, that's the important thing. So, um, <clears throat> so in the first line here, it talks about bad objects. And I thought, that's kind of strange. Is there really such a thing as a bad object? <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think we need to take that literally, especially considering Majjhimika uh, philosophy. You know, there's nothing that exists inherently, so there's no inherently existing bad object. Um, but bad object here means objects in relation to which we become afflicted disturbing emotions arise. So it could be people, it could be places, it could be objects like food, for example, coffee. <laughs> so objects that trigger our disturbing emotions. That's what's meant by bad objects. So it's important to understand that, that the problem isn't with the object, because sometimes it seems like it is, you know, it seems like it's the object that makes me angry or that makes me have attachment or, or whatever. It can appear that way, but we need to check more carefully. And according to um, Buddha's teachings about the mind, <clears throat> we have within our mind seeds of these disturbing emotions. Those seeds are there because of previous experiences of those disturbing emotions. So every time we get angry, one of the effects of anger is it leaves seeds on our mind. And then when we meet with certain objects or in certain situations, that's like water on the seeds, causing them to sprout and produce more experiences of anger. So we have tons of these seeds from this life, from past lives. They're just sitting there waiting. <laughs> and then when we meet with certain objects or certain situations, they get triggered off. 
So it's important to understand that the main problem is in here and not out there. Still, there are certain objects, people, places, and so on, that, you know, it's very hard for us to control ourselves. And so it's good to um, pay attention to our mind and our experiences. And if you do notice that there are such objects that you always get angry about, you always get attached to, then it is better to avoid those objects. It's similar to like a recovering alcoholic. Shouldn't go to bars or shouldn't be around places where people are drinking. Otherwise they see that and, you know, the craving comes up again and they may find themselves back in their old habit. Um, so if, if it's possible to completely avoid those objects, then that's good. If we can't completely avoid them, I mean, sometimes it's your parent or your sibling, and that wouldn't be nice to <laughs> completely avoid them. But we can try to minimize the contact that we have. And when we are in contact, when we are around those objects, be really, really careful. Just have that awareness that, you know, I might get angry. I might have attachment coming up and just be mindful. And then even if those disturbing emotions do pop up in our mind, well, it's because we're not Buddhas. We're not enlightened. We're not free from those. And um, so we can do purification afterwards, buzz yourself a purification or whatever. And then there's also lots and lots of remedies for working on those um, disturbing emotions. So the point then is avoid or at least minimize contact with those objects that stir up our disturbing emotions. And by doing that, our disturbing emotions will, in, will decrease. The second line is talking about distractions. And I think here distraction has me the meaning of busyness. You know, like when we're, our normal life, we can get so busy. There's just so many things to do. And of course, there's the phone and the internet and TV. And, you know, we could just keep ourselves busy all day long with things that aren't necessarily so helpful for our spiritual practice. And, um, and then we don't have so much time for spiritual practice. You know, we're too busy doing these other things. So we don't have time to meditate or study. Um, and then, even when we do sit down and meditate, <laughs> our mind is thinking about all these things that we just did and what we're going to do next and so on. So it, it interferes with our practice. So the best thing is to try to simplify our life and reduce all this busyness and just do the things that are really, really important, really essential or beneficial, you know, like helping others, um, so that we have more time for dharma practice, for virtuous practice, virtuous activities. And um, yeah, so simplify our life. And that's like in a retreat situation, this is exactly what we're doing here. Um, just doing the basic things, eating, sleeping, cleaning, um, and, and then meditating. So you can see how wonderful it is. You know, to have a, a much more simple lifestyle and fewer uh, objects that can stir up our disturbing emotions. Although, even if we're away from home and away from those objects, they can still be there in our mind, right? You know that. <laughs> so they can still pop up in our mind. But popping up in our mind, again, we, you know, it's unavoidable. We can't help it. But we can still learn to choose what we do with our mind. You know, if we recognize, oh, that thought, that I'm thinking about that person. And if I keep thinking, I'm probably going to have more attachment or more anger. Therefore, it's not good to go in that direction, to go with that thought. So put your mind to something else instead. They're just thoughts in our mind, like clouds in the sky. They're not permanent and fixed. So we can choose to go with them or not. So then the third line is about clarity of mind. So if we do these previous things, you know, reduce uh, distractions and stay away from objects that disturb up negative emotions, then our mind will be more clear, there'll be more clarity of mind, uh, more space in our mind, and then when we do practice and meditate, we'll be able to get more conviction in the teachings, you know, because if you're really looking at your experience and meditating on the teachings, you come to a point where you feel convinced, for example, in the Four Noble Truths, or that, you know, virtue leads to happiness, non-virtue leads to suffering. So you can see that for yourself. 
It's your experience. And that's really empowering, you know, when you can see for yourself through your own firsthand experience the truth of the teachings. Then, then it becomes really, really powerful. Even if someone tries to tell you otherwise, you're not going to listen because it's your experience. So um, these are benefits of being in solitude, being in retreat like this. And some people, there's a few rare cases of people who are able to go into retreat long term or even, you know, full time, like Milarepa or a more uh, recent uh, example, Jitsun Matenzin Palma, who spent 12 years in a cave in the Himalayas. I mean, these stories are just amazing and inspiring. Um, but probably most of us can't do that. And even if we try, you know, it doesn't work. <laughs> So we shouldn't feel bad about that. We should just rejoice in what they are doing, aspire to do that in the future, and then do whatever we can. There's so many things we can do in our daily life to create merit or positive potential with the wish that one day we'll be able to do more practice and uh, progress even more along the path. Okay, so that's just a few bits about that verse. and. Thank you for listening.